Hi, it's Dr. Crone. Welcome to our video lecture on differing types of political economies. So in the last video, we compared measures of the wealth and inequality of states. You could think of these measures as capturing kind of like the facts on the ground about the success of economic activity within a state. Today, what we're going to focus on is what drives political decision making about the economy within a state. Governments have strong influence on which type of political economy a state has. So basically, uh, political economists break down the types of political economies into three categories, free market economy, the command economy, and the mixed economy. And what underlies those three different types of economies is a different political approach to markets within the state. So in order to start to understand this, you have to understand the concept of a market and what an economist means by a market. So a market, according to Merriam-Webster, is an area of economic activity in which buyers and sellers come together and the forces of supply and demand affect prices. So a market for anything is essentially all the buyers and all the sellers of that product. So if we just take the example of the pizza market, um, part of the pizza market in Columbus, Ohio, is um, competition between Jets Pizza and, Pepper and Pizza Hut Pizza. And we can see that both of these um, vendors make uh, pepperoni pizza and it, and it looks different and it tastes different and you probably have your favorites among those two plus all the other pizza places that you could possibly buy pizza from we are part when we, when we decide we want to buy a pizza we are part of the pizza market we are a buyer and we have our choice between the various sellers and all of that together is part of the pizza market um, and so, for example, if there are more people wanting pizza, um, that is going to drive up the price. Uh, if there are lots and lots and lots of suppliers of pizza that are in competition with each other, that will actually lower the price. Um, this is all stuff you can uh, learn about in uh, economics class, and maybe uh, some of you have taken economics, so you understand this. Um, this is microeconomics, this idea of supply and demand and, and sort of setting um, a price. So <clears throat> that's what political scientists mean when they talk about a market. So if we return to the previous idea of the three different types of political economy, the real differences between these political economies is in how the market in general, all markets in the economy are regulated. So in a free market economy, the market sets the supply and demand. So the government doesn't get involved at all in pizza selling or in the selling of cars or in the selling of oil. Um, it is the number of people who want to buy that, uh, that commodity and the number of sellers that there are um, that work together uh, to uh, set up supply and demand. So there's no government intervention at all in an economy that we would call a free market economy. Many people think of the United States as having a free market economy, but today they really do not. Um, certainly though, at times in our past, we have had a completely free market economy, um, and so have uh, some of the countries of uh, Western Europe. Uh, that are considered to be capitalist countries. So I would say in the 1700s and 1800s, that was more a time when the United States had a true free market economy. At the opposite end of that is a command economy. And in here, the government sets the supply and demand for, the, uh, for a commodity, uh, for all commodities. Um, and a command economy is a uh, also very rare and um, there aren't very many left. Uh, the best examples we have of a, commun of a command economy are the communist countries, particularly the USSR and China during the century of the 1900s or really the, I don't know, last three quarters of the century of the, uh, of the 1900s. Um, there's really very few com true command economies left. Probably North Korea is a command economy. Um, Cuba, we could say, is a true command economy, 
but um, even communist China today uh, allows a, a different mix. Um, so most economies in the world today are what is called a mixed economy, where both government and market forces are at work. So the government does intervene, um, but there are also free market forces. It's a combination of the other two. And this is the US is an example of a mixed economy today, as are most developed nations. Um, in fact, most nations, even if they're not so developed. So you're going to learn a lot more about this. Um, there's a Khan Academy video linked in this um, as, as one of the requirements in this unit. It's called Command versus Market Economies. So if you want to, you can actually pause this video and go and watch that if you want a better understanding of those, or you can just wait until after the end of this video and then watch it, um, whichever order is fine with you. But just to let you know, that's just a, a brief introduction and there is more information available on, on each of those things and what they mean, if, especially if you're feeling confused. So what you might be asking is how do countries decide about what type of political economy they're going to have and where did these ideas come from anyway? So what we're gonna look at uh, now are the different theories of political economy that have been proposed by various uh, social theorists. Um, and those include neoliberalism, Marxism, um, what we, call communism or Leninism um, today, and then um, something called statism, or it's also can be called interventionism. So countries decide to adopt one or more of those economic theories, and along the way they might also bend and change them as they apply them. So we're gonna spend our next amount of time in this video looking at those different ideas and where they came from. So the first idea, neoliberalism, um, for many of us, the idea of liberal is associated with more government intervention in the economy, but that's not how what we mean by neoliberalism. In today's terminology, a neoliberal would actually be what we call a conservative. So neoliberalism is really the, the basis of the free market economy or the idea of capitalism. And this is um, the theory Series of this is based on the work of Adam Smith, a famous um, uh, economic theorist, writing a book called The Wealth of Nations. Um, and basically, Smith's idea is that the best way for a country to be wealthy is to have a free market, both within the country and also between countries. So Smith would say we shouldn't regulate trade, we shouldn't regulate markets within the country, um, the government shouldn't get involved at all. Um, he called it the invisible hand of the economy, that if you just left the economy alone, it would create the most wealth. Um, so what he called, uh, he, uh, I believe, coined the term laissez-faire, which is French, meaning the literal meaning it is, is allow them to do or allow it to happen, essentially. Um, and saying that, you know, it's a hands off government version of the economy. Um, and, and what Smith points out that we can see today is he says government intervention or too much government intervention in the economy doesn't work because uh, he uses something called public choice theory to say, look, people are self-interested, politicians are self-interested, and if we try to let politicians get involved in, in the markets, what's going to happen is they're going to get corrupt because they're going to want to make money. Everybody wants to make money is what Adam Smith believes. Um, and they're going to want to make money. There's no way to make them good and pure. Um, and so if the government is involved in sticking their hand into the economy, what they're going to be doing is stealing the money for themselves. And um, actually, there's uh, in your chapter that you're reading, um, there's the example of Nigeria, which is certainly a, a today example of what happens when the government has control of a very um, expensive resource in the country, which is oil. Um, and rather than using that, uh, they do regulate that oil market. They pretty much own the oil market. And rather than using it to enrich the nation and to do things that would be good for all the people in Nigeria, basically the government, or at least the history of the Nigerian government has been to, uh, to keep that money for the elites, to keep it for themselves. Um, and so in that way, Adam Smith is, uh, is exactly on point. 
So he, uh, Adam Smith, that neoliberalism is the foundation of what we think of today as the, the ideas of capitalism. And many of these probably sound very familiar to those of us um, who have mostly lived our lives in the United States or in the West. So the next economic theory, and it's really completely opposed, it's the polar opposite of neoliberalism, is Marxism. And Marxism is the work of the uh, German philosopher and theorist uh, Karl Marx and his uh, companion and co-writer Friedrich Engels. Um, and together they wrote a number of books. A Communist Manifesto is probably the most um, well-known one and a book called Das Kapital, which is very challenging to read. And it's um, basically both of these explain in depth his theories. Now, Marx, the most important thing for us to know, especially if you grew up in the West, in the United States or, or the West, um, I grew up in the 1980s when the West was opposed to communism. And so, uh, you know, I got a very um, skewed view of what Karl Marx did. I thought that he invented um, the big bad uh, Russian communist, what we were taught uh, as big bad Russian communist way of uh, running their their country. But that's actually not true about Marx. Marx did not invent a command economy. He never, he never said he thought a command economy um, he, he would not have even had a concept of a command economy. Marx's work was really what he did best and what his work is really focused on is a critique of capitalism. And as a critique of the problems of capitalism, it is one of the most brilliant works um, ever written. And I think any economist, whether you're a neoliberal or, or a, a Marxist or anywhere in between would agree that he really is the leading crit critic of capitalism, and he makes a strong case. Now, whether you believe his case is, is you know, whether you buy it is, uh, is obviously differs among people, but it is a strong critique of capitalism. And what Marx did was he looked at Adam Smith's ideas and how they played out on the ground over a hundred years or so in um, Germany and also in England. Marx spent most of his time in exile from Germany in England because he was um, he was persecuted in Germany. So he escaped to England and did most of his studying um, there. And so he based a lot of his critique on what he saw in the 1800s unregulated free market of um, of England and how it created uh, wealth inequality. It also created um, very bad working conditions for uh, laborers. So one of the things Marx was really looking at the coal mining industry and how exploitative it was of workers. Um, and, uh, and he really was on the side of workers and said, you know, these people aren't getting paid enough. They're putting their health at risk. Um, the, the, the capitalists who own these are, are not caring about the, the workers at all. They're not trying to protect them. They're just, um, you know, exploiting them for wealth. Um, so he focused on that inequality. And what to him, what he saw was that these laborers were obviously being workers all across the economy were being exploited so that the very top percent could get wealthy. And he, what he saw was that capitalism to him held within it, he called it the seeds of its own destruction. Because what he thought was if workers got educated enough, and, and at the time there was not universal education. So he thought if, if, if these workers get educated enough, they're going to start to see how unfair the system is. And eventually they'll all rise up against the unfairness of the system. As soon as we start explaining it to them, in other words, their eyes will be open and they'll say, yes, why are we part of this? Why are we pawns in this terrible system? Um, we deserve better than this. We deserve, you know, all kinds of things. And that he, what he thought was that the workers would rise up and overthrow a capitalist system um, and yes, he did think that that probably would be a, a violent revolution, um, but that what the workers would do is establish a what he called um, a, a communist system where everybody would uh, be treated equally and there would be no inequality of wealth at all. There would be it would be a zero on or a, um, yeah a zero on the Gini index, essentially what we what we learned about in the last video. Um, 
And, and Marx said almost nothing about how this would happen or what a state would look like after it. In fact, he actually thought that the state itself was a tool of capitalism and that the state would wither away and there would just be sort of like a global, really utopia. It was a, very much a utopian, a global utopia without any, um, any where, where all the workers participated in um, in their own well-being and in the shared well-being of everyone. So it sounded really great. Um, and one thing that happens when a lot of people study Marxism, young people study Marxism, is they think, wow, this sounds awesome. This sounds really, really great. Um, and uh, certainly many, many intellectuals read Marx and said, this sounds fantastic. How can we hurry this process up and how can we make Marx's ideas happen. Um, and that leads us to this idea of communism, uh, which is a combination of Leninism and Stalinism and really is not related, it is not what Marx meant when he said communist. When Marx meant communist, what he said is it's going to be this stateless utopia. But where in societies that have applied Marxism, um, what's happened is that the state did not wither away. And in fact, it became totalitarian and, um, and authoritarian. And that is not at all what Marx had in mind. Um, so how did that happen? How did we get from this sort of utopia idea to um, to something that that a, a kind of economic theory that seems to lead in many cases to uh, to authoritarian uh, rule? So here's what happened. So um, a man named Vladimir Lenin is a leader, an intellectual in the Soviet Union in the well, what was Russia at the time um, in the early late. 1910s and he's he has he believes in marx he's a marxist and he's the leader of a group of of um intellectuals who are uh agitating against the russian government who are marxists but lenin's problem is that if you look at marx's theory marx says countries go through a feudal period which can last for thousands of years and then they go through a capitalist period uh, which can last for hundreds of years and then eventually capitalism the uh the uh, workers in a capitalist system will rise up and they'll do away with capitalism so russia is feudal and according to marx you'd have to wait hundreds of years for this process to happen automatically the way Marx thinks it's going to happen. And Lenin is impatient. He wants to see this in his own lifetime. He wants to see this happening soon. So he comes up with this theory that of a vanguard party and the vanguard party is a political party. A vanguard means leader or the front of the pack. Um, so vanguard party is a leading party and what he's going to do what what lenin is going to do is sort of he knows better than the workers what's in their best interest so rather than wait for them to move from peasants into worker into factory workers and, and after generations finally get the clue that they're being exploited he's just going to tell them they're exploited and he's going to lead a revolution uh, before Russia even gets to a full-on capitalist system. It was in the process of developing from feudal to capitalistic at the time that Lenin was active. Um, and his revolution worked. It absolutely worked. Uh, bloody revolution. The Communist Party uh, takes over Russia. Um, and Lenin says, okay, well, now I'm uh, in charge. And he designed government institutions and this is the thing Marx never saw, never predicted. But what Lenin says is, we need temporary government institutions to run this government-led, to run a government-led communist system until everybody gets on board and then the state will slowly wither away, just like Marx said it would. Um, so he designs institutions based on the idea that the government will own industries. Lenin and Stalin, but mostly Lenin, are the ones who think of this idea of a command economy. Um, Lenin really starts it and Stalin is the person who actually develops this whole idea of a command economy. The government's going to own the interest industries. There's going to be almost no market competition. Lenin allowed for more free market competition. He thought a 
a balance would be good. Stalin, who took over after Lenin died, Lenin dies at a, a fairly young age from tuberculosis and um, Stalin takes over and Stalin um, is a Marxist by name, but what he really is is a dictator. And so he um, gathers power around him and invents this idea of a command economy where the government, which you can learn about in your um, in the other video, where the government controls every aspect of the economy. So don't blame what happened in Russia and China as much on Marx as you can on these guys um, who are the ones who, who sort of decided uh, on the vanguard party. Interestingly enough, um, Marx's theories never came true, uh, or at least so far haven't come true, uh, of the, uh, the withering away of the capitalist state. We have not seen a country where, um, so far, where the workers uh, become enlightened and rise up against their capitalist masters and uh, where the state withers away. Um, the, the only countries that have applied Marx's theories are countries that have had some form of um, government um, command economy or, or some form of mixed economy. Okay, our final type of um, economy uh, is the one that most people, uh, most countries have today. And that's called statism or some, uh, some thinkers refer to it as interventionism. Um, and statism is a, really a combination of um, Adam Smith's ideas about free markets and then Marx's critique, not Marx, not communism, um, the way that it was practiced in Russia and China, but um, the, the Marx's critiques of capitalism. So it's, it's really a, an attempt to make capitalism better, sort of a kinder, gentler version of capitalism. So statism is centered on the idea that the free market is the best way to grow an economy and, and create wealth. But statism recognizes a lot of the critiques that Marx comes up with. Um, especially the inequality critique. So he says, so statism says actually um, the free market has two types of shortcomings. The inequality that Marx points out, so you get big gaps between the rich and the poor, but also it has instability because markets don't care whether countries go through giant swings of economic uh, depression and uh, prosperity. Um, and those in that economic instability, those swings of, uh, of economic prosperity and then recession and depression, those things uh, create difficulties for governments, obviously. Um, it's hard to govern people who don't have enough food. Um, and so statism says the state should play a role in helping both of those shortcomings or in trying to ameliorate both of those shortcomings. So the state should play a role in regulating markets um, for stability, and it should also play a role in providing a social safety net to deal with the, the inequality. And almost every country in the world today follows some version of statism, which leads to a mixed economy, including the United States. Now, states can very much differ on how much the state plays a role and what type of role the state plays but most countries follow some version of that. So I'll just give you some examples of state interventions in a market economy like the United States. Um, the first category is the provision of public goods. So one thing that has been recognized over the past 100 to 150 years or so in states is that there are certain goods where the market doesn't work particularly well. Um, where market forces uh, don't create good for the society. They create wealth, but they don't create good. So things like highways. There's not enough profit in making a highway for how could you charge all the users of a highway? Uh, we try to do that with toll roads. Um, but the idea of transportation in your car as being a market is kind of hard to see. So that a, a roads are a great example of public goods. Defending the country, um, 
you know, if we really let defense be up to the market, it would literally be how much defense does, uh, do people want to pay for? Everybody would have to pay for their own defense and everybody would have to hire their own defense companies and there'd be competition. And that's probably not the best way to defend a country from foreign invasion. Um, things like public health, um, dealing with communicable diseases. We've all got a lot of experience with that right now. Law enforcement, education, et cetera. Um, so, so many, most states around the world have, have understood that there are goods where the government needs to be involved um, because the public shares equally in their access benefits and costs. Um, and so the, the problem here, or the, or the things that governments have to work out for themselves in a society is what is and is not a public good. In some countries, healthcare is considered a public good, one where free market is, is not creating um, uh, optimal outcomes. Um, and so the government is involved in, in providing healthcare resources, just like they're involved in providing highways or defense. Um, but different states make different answers to that. So certainly the United States uh, answer to healthcare is that it, it is not a public good. It should be a private good provided by the free market. So all of these details about what is and is not a public good are debatable within a, within a society that has a mixed economy. Um, another thing that states do in a market economy is to is is correcting the stability or preserving the stability, and so that is correcting or preventing market failures, uh, things like a big economic collapse. And we're we are seeing right now in the midst of the COVID nineteen. Um, problems, the enormous economic problem that that has created for most countries around the world. And we're seeing countries using fiscal and monetary policy to try to, um, to try to encourage more economic stability and to correct or prevent market failure. So fiscal policy is the policy of government taxing and spending. So when a government raises or cuts taxes or raises or cuts its government spending, that is called fiscal policy. So one thing many countries, including the United States, have done is to cut taxes in an economic slowdown to try to stimulate the growth of the economy. Monetary policy is, uh, has to do with uh, macroeconomic ideas about regulation of interest rates and the money supply. Um, in the United States, we have the Federal Reserve, which is in charge of monetary policy, um, which can also stimulate or slow down the economy, um, setting or influencing the value of the currency of the country. Uh, those kind of things are, are designed to um, impact the, the stability of an economy. And then finally, uh, the third type of intervention a state can have in the economy is the creation of a welfare state. So a welfare state are the state provided provisions for the economically vulnerable. And this is welfare states go to address Marx's critique that, um, that the, the problem with capitalism is that people are left out um, and that it causes suffering. And so um, unlike Marxists and communists who, who say, well, the answer to that problem is to create totally total equality by um, uh, getting rid of the idea of labor and management, essentially, um, a, a different approach to that would be in a, in a more of a free market economy would be to make up for the problems of a free market economy by having um, a social safety net. And so let's say, who are, the, who are vulnerable to problems of a free market economy? So the free market economy is, I can work, uh, the harder I work, the more I get paid. Um, I sell my labor for a wage. Um, and this is excellent for people who are strong and healthy and, and um, able to work hard. Um, but on the other hand, there are vulnerable people. So the elderly who can no longer work or the disabled or sick who can't work or who have never been able to work. Um, children uh, who can't fend for themselves. You can't send, you can't take a child and say, well, we're sorry, you're poor, but you should just go get a job. 
um, they're not ready for work yet, they're not strong enough, big enough, uh, they haven't been educated enough. Or those in generational poverty who have not experienced the uh, benefits of the education system or other things that can be provided for by families that have, uh, that, that have uh, come from more wealth. So the idea of a welfare state is to provide those kind of provisions. And most countries today have at least some level of a welfare state. So let's look at why those states develop, because there are three answers to that question by political scientists. The first one is a Marxist explanation, and the Marxist explanation says that a welfare state develops in a free market economy. Um, the capitalists grudgingly agree to a welfare state so that the workers won't rise up and have a, uh, have a revolution. Um, so this perspective sees the capitalists at work here sort of tossing the poor a bone so there won't be a revolution. Um, that's one theory, and that would be favored by people who are Marxists or communists. Um, another idea which is favored by neoliberals is the idea that it is creeping socialism, that a welfare state develops because socialists in the country who eventually want to control the state and have a command economy, uh, this is a step along the way. So that there are, for, for neoliberals, they see the danger of people believing in Marxist theories or Marx, Marxist argument, um, that it's socialists uh, who, who would really like to see more state intervention, but they're willing to, to settle for a welfare state for now. And then finally, the last one is a humanitarian um, understanding of this or a cultural understanding, which is that over a period of time, um, as, as history has progressed, people, especially in the West, um, have developed a notion that protecting the vulnerable is a good thing in general, and that that is a cultural value in a state and that the state should reflect that value because the social institutions that promote the value like religions and charities aren't enough to truly protect the vulnerable. So that's, these are three different perspectives on why a country might have a welfare state. So something for you to consider for the discussion board is what do you think about the welfare state? Do you think it's a good thing or a negative thing or somewhere in between? Do you think states have a responsibility to protect the vulnerable and how far should that go? Who do you see as vulnerable? And which one of those theories do you think is the best explanation for why a welfare state develops? That's all we've got for this video. I know it was a long one. It's a lot of new information. So remember to digest it. Think about how it relates to other parts of the, of the, uh, the course material for this week. And remember to post those thoughts to the discussion board. Thanks, and I will see you soon.